Emmy-nominated choreographer Chloe Arnold is a force of nature. With her talent, grit, determination, and a little help from Beyonce, Chloe catapulted her all-female tap dancing group to the international spotlight. At its heart, the syncopated ladies, fierce rhythms, and soulful grooves celebrate Chloe's beginnings. The interesting thing is syncopated ladies, when I reflect back, was really just my manifestation of what I loved so much in my childhood, which was dancing with my sisters. You're listening to Moving Moments, the podcast that explores the dance world's most accomplished and groundbreaking artists. I'm your host, Alicia Graf Mack, Dean and Director of Dance at the Juilliard School. During each episode, you'll hear me talk with some of my closest friends and most trusted colleagues as we sit down to hear about their creative process and how they are changing the dance world on and off the stage. Before we get into the nitty gritty of all of your successes, I have to start by asking, how do you do it? Well, I tell you what, I honestly, I think I've always had a high capacity for many things. I think from very young, the way I grew up, I played every sport that you could play. Swimming, tennis, basketball, football, soccer, um, tag. I mean, literally any game, <laughs> if someone's playing it, they had a game called King of the Mountain. I wanted to be the King of the Mountain. So I, I was always very active, but then I was also very much a scholar and I always loved doing community service. That was just like a norm even though we were also the community that needed servicing, we still made sure that we were giving back in any ways we could with the little means that we had. So I think that all of those things just got amplified now as an adult, whereby I still enjoy all of those things in different ways. Chloe, I can feel your energy just in your words. When I think of you, I always think of this really bright, light, and energetic person. Thank you. Uh, you really do uh, bring a lot of joy to people's lives. It's not just like something that you use as a brand. It's something that you live authentically every day. Thank you. It means a lot. I always think of you and I think of, it's so random how you have like particular memories, but I remember visiting you in St. Louis. Yes. <laughs> at that time together. And it's just so wonderful to see, to be able to be friends with someone for a really long time mm. so that you can understand their markers in their journey. Mm. That's something that I think we'll talk about throughout this conversation is this idea of sisterhood. Mm -hmm. Before we get to that, I want to stay at your early beginnings. What were those moments like those seeds of getting a step or stepping on to the stage or performing for the community that created that magic inside of you? The first thing I remember, you know, we have photos and videos of things. So sometimes the video jogs a memory. Mm -hmm. But when I really remember not from a video, but from just like the experience was going to see the movie Tap in theaters. Mm. I remember what theater we went to. I remember walking down the sidewalk towards the theater and like the excitement I felt inside. And then I remember leaving the movie fully affected and saying, this is what I want to do with my life. This is it. This is everything. And then very fortunately, within about a year of seeing that movie, Gregory Hines came to DC and he performed and taught and I got to see him live and being able to meet him was truly the joining of this fantasy mm. and the possibility becoming real by seeing the person is actually real. Yes. And feeling their their performance in person. And I'll, I'll never forget his performance. And again, none of these things are on video and that's how I know they were so impacting because mm. it's just what I felt. Then from that experience, I was able to do all these other incredible master classes from a lot of tap masters. But the, the then next time that I saw Gregory Hines was I was performing in a youth company and we were in a lineup at the Kennedy Center mm -hmm. and Gregory Hines was the headliner. So now it was an opportunity that I got to perform on the concert hall stage at the Kennedy Ooh. Center 
in a lineup that included the Nicholas Brothers and Lon Chaney and Jimmy Slide and Gregory Hines. And that was the life shift. I think that, mm-hmm. and again, I, at that time, I was probably honestly 12. So I was very young. And that's the interesting thing about finding your place, like finding where you need to be. Because at that time, I was training with a teacher who was a white man and from France, and he was lovely. You know, I have nothing bad to say about him, just except that I literally just didn't fit in that space. He taught me so much about technique, and I learned so much technique and musicality and wonderful things in the jazz space, which was wonderful as a foundation. But he didn't understand understandably, how to draw out my black girl magic. I think that Miss Tony saw that and talked to my mom. And and again, not in a vicious way of like trying to steal students. It wasn't like that. It was more just like, I see something in your daughter and I know what needs to be pulled out because I was Mm. really shy. I was very reserved. And when I got to Miss Tony, she had so much work to do (laughs) to get me (laughs) To literally shine, to literally find that black girl magic within me and to be unapologetic. Because Mm. I certainly, honestly, in that very white space, was dimming my light Mm -hmm. and was kind of basing my worth maybe around the technical abilities that I was lacking. Again, challenges like that I'm thankful for because I don't run from a challenge. But I just think that there comes a time when getting technique isn't enough. And you have to have someone that understands how to find that inner voice and then help you amplify it. Yeah, and that's what we aspire to do as dancers or artists, right? Yes. You want your body and you as a musical artist, as a tapper, to speak volumes. Yes. We're not able to actually open our mouths and say, I am... And this is what I'm about. You not only studied tap, but you studied jazz and ballet. And can you believe there was actually no hip hop training? I know. At the, when we I, were know. I know. But Isn't some that of my funny? students say, did you study hip hop? I said, uh, there was no, <laughs> no. coined hip hop training. No. That's so what most... people just did outside in yeah, the street in your community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like you learned the Running Man because you knew the Running Man. You know, you know the Cat yeah. Scratch. You know the Roger Rabbit. You just know. You just know. <laughs> we learned dances in the basement of my best friend's townhouse. We would watch music videos. I remember LL Cool J, Round the Way Girl. Mm-hmm. That choreo was like banging. And, and, it, and again, <laughs> all of that. Yeah, hip hop was just like. You learned it because it was the culture and it was just natural. Like you either were in or you weren't. Yeah. <laughs> you either knew it or you didn't. But um, in terms of other genres, I remember, okay. So when I went to Miss Tony, that was another thing that was different. Miss Tony had been on Broadway. And so she was like, if you want to be in this, in this tap company, you have to take a mandatory uh, company class in ballet and in creative movement, modern. And so there was no choice. I'm not gonna lie, we kind of dragged our feet at first because we're like, we just wanted to tap. But (laughs) God bless Miss Tony for not letting that be an option because I'm so thankful for the gifts that it gave me because I, the most pivotal audition that I've ever had that I also got, right? Because, you know, we have a lot of auditions. Yeah. The most pivotal one was when I was 14, I went to audition for Debbie Allen. She was doing a play at the Kennedy Center called Pepito's Story. Mm -hmm. It was ballet centered. I got in that big old line and I got cut. Miss Tony hadn't gotten me yet together. And then two years later, Debbie came back to do another play and this play had a more diverse styles. It was tap, it was Lindy, jazz, there was ballet too, but I went into that audition now with a greater understanding of my body, Mm -hmm. just like understanding, you know, I wasn't getting cure off training, but I was at least learning and getting the foundations under my, under my wing. And so when I went to that next audition, it's a fun story because I snuck into that audition (laughs) with a friend of mine and we went up to Miss Allen and we said, hi, Miss Allen, we tap dance. And she was like, well, show me something, honey. (laughs) <laughs> and we saw, like, which was so nice because she could have been like, why are you in the room? Right. Go to the end of the line. So we show her our tap moves and she's like, amazing. Now go put your jazz shoes on. 
And I was like, ooh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so I go back to the end of the line and it's like 800 people. And now I'm nervous because I'm like, uh-oh, we're getting to, to some jazz technique, uh-oh. <laughs> Um, but I went in there and I remember just from having worked with Miss Tony, this concept of like full out, she mm -hmm. like dance full out. And so I was like, you know what? No matter what happens, I'm about to dance full out. And I'll never forget the move that I, that we did. And it was this like hip and head throw in a <laughs> rhythm. And that rhythmic pattern sticks in my head today. But I was like, that's my moment. That, that right there, that's gonna be the moment where I show her what I made up. And fortunately it worked out and I got, I ended up getting that position in that play. And that is how Debbie became my mentor. Without Miss Tony having said, you cannot tap dance in this company without being versatile, I would not have been able to get that role in her show. Uh, and this, my entire life would be totally different. So Miss Tony, thank you for being a visionary. She has passed on. Chloe, in talking to you, I feel like we can't move forward with your story until we talk about spaces and race. How did race play into all that as part of your identity and how you navigated being a biracial woman? So, you know, it's really interesting because there are a couple of factors that come into play heavily. One, being from DC automatically gives you a sense of black pride because especially when we were growing up, the city was probably somewhere like 88% black. You saw black people in every layer of the community from the most impoverished to the most wealthy and every way, shape and form a black person could be actualized, they were, which is a very encouraging thing because you're not seeing this very limited scope of how people might view the view mm -hmm. black people or culture. My mom is amazing because, well, she she's from France. And what was so incredible about her, when my parents were together when we were younger, my dad was really adamant, very adamant, about us understanding black culture, our black identity, because he survived civil rights. He survived Vietnam. He is a little older. So he was definitely, you know, he lived in segregation. So his understanding of race in America was so in depth that he refused to let us not understand where we were coming from and what we might be up against. Mm. And what was so amazing about my mom is that she was down with the movement for equality. And that's how my dad and her ended up even being able to be compatible. And so my mom was very well read, very well experienced, meaning putting herself in positions to understand, observe, learn, be immersed in black culture in ways that surely were dangerous for her mm -hmm. and uncomfortable for her. There was a time once my parents separated, we lived in a community, a black community, she was the only white woman. Mm -hmm. But she was so embraced because the way that she respects the culture is mm -hmm. so beautiful and genuine. Our bookshelves were filled with black literature that, you know, to be young, gifted and black by Lorraine Hansberry, mm -hmm. you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X. My mom made sure that I learned, memorized Maya Angelou's Still I Rise and Phenomenal Woman. Our white mom made sure we knew what Kwanzaa was and that we celebrated it in mm -hmm. the house. And so she was determined to make sure that in an America that is so defined by race, and so uh, where opportunities are so um, disparate based around race and gender that she would be equipping us with a sense of self that would help us navigate any room. And I'm very thankful that I already understood how the color of my skin could yield different results than my white counterparts. No one's ever asked that question, by the way. Well, you know, we have a lot in common. For me personally, it is inspiring and humbling to hear from someone who I know has traversed in ways that I have. So thank you for sharing so much. Thank you. There's something else that we have in common. Yeah. We are both graduates of Columbia University. Why did you decide to study film at Columbia and not pursue your love of dance yes. at school? These are great questions. Okay, 
New York was my dream from the get-go. So mission was get to New York. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then Columbia gets me to New York. Now it's like, what do I study? Well, at Columbia, the highest level of tap is intermediate. And therefore, it was not going to work for me mm. because I was already at that point advanced. I signed up to major in acting because I was like, mm. oh, acting will be great. You know, Debbie always said, learn more things. So I was like, I'll study theater. Boom. So I signed up for the theater program. I'm all hyped. I'm like, yeah, I'm the actress. <laughs> and I go through the program and then I ended up getting one of my first gigs, which was an industrial to perform at the Microsoft Dome in Seattle for Bill Gates's annual meeting of his company where there'd be mm -hmm. 15,000 people and it was paying so well and we were going to stay at the W and all this amazing, you know, and at per diem. And like, I was like, <laughs> this is the greatest, right? And I also needed the money. I was a broke college student for real. So I go to my teacher and I tell him what I got. Like, oh my gosh, I have this opportunity. I'm going to have to miss a day of class. Could I please do so? He was like, his, he wrote a letter back to me that said, if you miss one more time, I'm going to fail you. <gasps> and I was like, oh. And he was the head of the, the head of the theater department. So there was no going around because I'm going to go around if I can. And so then I had that moment where I was like, what would Debbie Allen do? She would learn how to direct. And so that's how I pivoted to film. That film degree really gave me the courage to step into that space. And then it gave me the greater courage to say, okay, well now how do I take my love for tap and my love for film and merge them. Mm -hmm. And really, I think I was probably the only film student at Columbia whose sole mission was to put dance on film and mm -hmm. specifically tap. Nothing is by mistake, right? Sometimes that no is the golden opportunity to find a yes somewhere else. That's right. The Dean part of me <laughs> who often receives those types of I know, I was thinking outside that. opportunity I requests. <laughs> is like dying inside right I now. know. I was thinking, <laughs> I literally was thinking just now, I was like, wow, you'd be who I'd have to come to and ask. Um, and I, I mean, I definitely was that student. Oh, I pushed every envelope there was that existed. I have this picture. It's one of my all-time favorite pictures. It's of me and my sister, Daisha sitting with you and Maude at a karaoke bar some random night. We were all hanging out. I need this. And we took a picture of the four of us. We all had our huge curly wild hair out, dancer legs out. Oh my God. And we look like quadruplets. Oh my God. It's, I it's need the best. That. I'll send it to you. Yay. I'm curious to know what a community of sisterhood means to you and why you've been so intentional in empowering women and children to pursue their dreams? Um, growing up, sisterhood for me, from the beginning of time, meaning from when I'm six years older than Maude, so from whence she was born, I viewed myself as a caretaker. I babysat her, and you know, when, you have a, when you're growing up in a single parent home, you end up helping to raise whoever's younger than you. But my sister and I, because we had the same interests, I was the person that took her to dance. We probably started taking the subway around 12 years old, very young, mm -hmm. and the bus, very young. I took her to school. But I think that that laid the groundwork for me understanding that my actions fully influenced another human being. Mm. That everything I did, she repeated, right? Be it good or bad, if I'm acting up, she trying to act up, right? So this idea of understanding we must be good kids because our mom is counting on us to do so. And we have this autonomy, but if we don't respect it, we will lose it. And also this idea of if we want to succeed, it's on us. We understood that if we did really well in school and that we focused to be great at the, at the skills that we were learning, that we could rise honestly out of poverty mom was making around $26,000 a year for four people. She would teach us, if you want to be in that activity, you better find a scholarship, find a way in, go talk to your coach, go talk to your teacher. So mm -hmm. she, gave, she equipped us with the courage 
to mm-hmm. have hard conversations really young to be able to empower our experience. And she was never, she never shied away from hard work and never let us do that as well. So I think this sisterhood idea of like when people are like, oh, you all work together, is that hard? It's like, no, it's not hard because we were mopping an apartment building hallway together <laughs> as kids. Being able to host an event where people come dance, that's exciting. I think, you know, the sisterhood that my sister and I shared was so key to how I do everything. Mm. And then Miss Tony had that spirit in her. She also was a sister. And our tap company was predominantly Black women. And it was amazing, the sisterhood that came out of that. Again, the foundational ethics, morals, values, work ethic, you know, Miss Tony always said, the way you practice is the way you perform. And she never let us practice any less than we were to show up on stage. So the interesting thing is syncopated ladies, when I reflect back, was really just my manifestation of what I loved so much in my childhood, which was dancing with my sisters. So last week, we had a very interesting conversation about the business of dance and entertainment and how to work through the inevitability of letdowns and disappointments in this kind of work. You shared that you were at the gym working out, which I, I love seeing all of your workout uh, clips and videos because I don't think I could ever do some of the things that you are doing with your brother and with Maude. And you said you opened your email and read that a big opportunity had fallen through. And then you said, And you know what I realized, Alicia? It's about setting yourself up with long vision. And then you went right back to working out. (laughs) Can you describe what you meant about seeing with long vision and how you've managed to create this type of perspective? I think that I just always knew. Like, I truly would say to myself, it's not today, but it's going to be one day. I learned to recognize disappointment as just an opportunity to find another avenue. And so when things didn't happen for me in the early days, I remember, I remember this very vividly. There was a very famous choreographer that will remain nameless. And I had done everything I could imagine to train to be in his company. I showed up to like every practice, every jam session, every rehearsal, like any and everything I could do to better myself, to learn, to be humble, to just be in the space. And I remember him offering the position to my friends in front of me and not offering it to me. And I had all these feelings, you know, hurt because of the way it was delivered. It's like, started to get that eye of the tiger back. And I'm like, hold up, you don't know me. And like, right, I'm like, you don't know, you don't know where I come from, right? You don't understand what I'm made of. And I literally shifted my entire consciousness from me needing a gatekeeper to let me in to I'm going to create something. I don't know what it is yet because I didn't know what it was at that point. But something is going to get created from my voice and I will no longer seek approval because I realized in that moment that the mean with which I was handled is not something I want to even be around. Mm. Even if that job is the hottest job, hottest ticket in town, I don't care because it's not healthy and it doesn't feel good. And so that is why in the world in which I've created with Syncopated Ladies, why I've focused so much on sisterhood and empowerment because I was in spaces that made me feel tiny. Mm. And so... Debbie was really, again, the shifting point because the thing about Debbie Allen that was different from everyone else is when she gave people opportunities, number one, you had to earn them. And number two, once you were in them, she gave you the freedom to catapult, but you had to do the work. So it was truly like, I'm going to give you the training. I'm going to kick your butt. I'm going to show you the land, but you got to do the work. And that was a space in which I thrived. Because it was like tough, but so loving, not degrading of my character, or my person, but just like, I see you. I know your greatness. Are you really 
given your greatness today. And I really appreciate her to the core for what she did to see me, but not coddle me. Ultimately, the legacy that I hope to impart is one where people, my students know how much I believe in them and want for them to achieve their personal greatness. Yes. Let's talk about Syncopated Ladies, okay. your all-female tap company. And listeners, if you are unfamiliar with Syncopated Ladies, I strongly recommend that you do a so simple Google search and you'll see so much. In fact, you'll be hooked to try to watch every video. Can you start by sharing the inspiration behind Syncopated Ladies? Yeah, I was working with Debbie my senior year of college in the summer and at the Debbie on Dance Academy. And she said, well, what's next for you? Because I, was gra I graduated. I said, I'm gonna guess I'm gonna go to New York and try to make it. And she said, I think that LA will be better for you than New York. And I was, mm. like, I was shocked because I was thinking, but there's so much tap in New York. I said, well, I can't afford to come to LA. I'd love to, but I'll go work. I'll get some money and then I'll come. She said, no, baby, you gotta come now. Time is of the essence, let's go. And she was like, you can, you can live with me until you figure it out. And so I lived with her for the first three months of being in LA. And when I mm -hmm. tell you, that changed my whole everything, my whole life, everything. Because at that moment, I understood that I was on a different trajectory. Mm. There was no precedence, except a Debbie Allen who'd done it in her way mm -hmm. through jazz and in her way, but that I was gonna have to Debbie Allen, this tap world, you right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I have to like figure it out. And she had the Debbie Allen Dance Academy and, and I had a group of awesome female tap students. And it was one particular night where we were all jamming and it was so rare that girls would jam. You would mm -hmm. have a jam session and maybe there'd be one girl, one woman, maybe two, but not all. That night was the pivotal moment where I said, these women are special, these girls, they were girls, 11, 14, 15. And I asked Debbie if I could start Syncopated Ladies at her studio, uh. and she gave me space to incubate this idea. It took nine years of me working as a solo artist and saving money and earning money for me to say, I can now invest my money into making this a real company. Mm. Mm -hmm. And again, it was a lot of growing pains from there where all of the women really invested and sacrificed to help me get this off the ground because again, it was all self-funded. And so that was when I brought my film skills together with my dance skills and we produced right. our first content. And those were tap dance music videos. And one that really changed our lives was our tap salute to Beyonce. Yes. And that video to end of time she ended up sharing it on our Facebook page and saying they killed it. And that transported our lives. It was unreal. And I thank Beyonce so much because again, sisterhood, seeing other women and saying, mm. I'm gonna give you my platform so that your voice can be heard. So Sink of the Ladies have now been together 19 years. That's crazy. And then we have some women who were in that first iteration who teach for some of our social programs. So it's amazing because it all you know, it all aligns. And mm -hmm. the number one thing, a lot of people are like, how do I get in sync ladies and boom, boom, boom. Yes, you have to have the skill, but more importantly, you have to have the heart that sisters come first. And that is what is the hardest thing, I think, to find people who value like rocking with a team mm -hmm. without the ego part. We don't fight over who's getting that solo. It's so funny because it's more like, y'all want the solo? Who wants the solo? It's more like pass the solo. And I love that spirit. And as a result, we've been able to make these, what many would view as impossible opportunities possible. Working with Beyonce, having executive producing our own nationwide tour. Now the movie that I choreographed called Spirited, all the sync ladies are in it. These things wouldn't happen without solidarity and belief in that which they could not see. When we started this, there wasn't a penny to rub together. There were no <laughs> shows, there were no jobs. And next thing you know, we're on So You Think You Can Dance together. It's a beautiful thing to rock with people who believe in you and who mm. share a similar 
purpose and value system. Amen. What is the creative thread that holds your life together? I would say the idea or concept of tapping into love. Mm-hmm. That tap is the heartbeat of all of this. It's the first language. It's the thing that has carried me around the world. The art of tap is an art form that came out of the necessity for freedom and the, necess- the necessity for a voice. And so for me, tap has been that voice. And so I think that that's what I carry through my foundation work, through my movie work, through my fitness life and my performing life is just staying on purpose, understanding why do I tap dance? Because it feels amazing. And it feels amazing not because I'm always joyous, but because no matter what I'm going through in life, it transforms me and it transports me to the space where I'm happiest. When you're looking at your life with long vision, what do you see as your legacy? For me, I I pray that my legacy encourages others to identify their purpose and go relentlessly in the direction of their dreams, knowing that any and everything is possible. And you do that. Thank Every you. day. So Thank keep going, you. sister. Keep Thanks, going. Thanks, Alicia. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being with me today. Yes. Congrats. Moving moments. Let's go. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of Moving Moments. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow the show, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up with future episodes, follow us on Instagram at Moving Moments Podcast and visit us at artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist's moving moments. <laughs>